Hi, my name is Danielle Webb. I am a pediatric dietitian, and I'm here to talk to you today about infant formulas. I have a few objectives that I want to go over with you, some of the things we're going to talk about today. The first is going to be define and understand the types of common infant formulas that are available on the market. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to try to learn when to use those different types of formula for what patient population. And then I also want to go over how to mix infant formula. This is a really important part of growth and development is making sure we're mixing formulas correctly, so we're actually going to work on that today as well. So the first formula I want to talk about is the standard formula. A lot of people, that's what they call it, is just the standard formula. It's a milk protein-based formula. Those are going to be iron fortified, and they're going to be for full-term infants. These are not for premature infants. These are for full-term infants only. The standard mixing, when you mix it according to the package directions, are going to be 20 calories per ounce. There are other ways to mix it, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but standard mixture across the board is 20 calories. And then when to use these. We're going to use these for the full-term infant that has no feeding intolerance issues. So this may be a baby that is born and mom says to you, hey, I'm not really sure what formula to choose. It's very overwhelming to see what's on the market out there because there are a lot of formulas when you walk into the grocery store and it can be overwhelming for a consumer. So to be able to help a mom know this is a standard formula, this is a formula that's nutritionally complete, and this is something that you can pick for your baby and feel comfortable giving them, that is what a mom needs to hear. So some of those examples of those formulas are going to be Infamil Infant, Similac Advance, Infamil Neuro Pro Infant, Similac Organic. Um, I included the organic version just so that you would know there, there are organic options out there for parents that do want to have an organic formula. So that's always an option as well. Sometimes with formulas, it's definitely going to be specific to what a parent wants for their baby as well. The next is going to be a soy formula. So what we're actually doing today is we're kind of starting at the top with what is a standard formula, and we're going to make our way down the list. And this is sort of how you would actually change up formulas as well if you had some intolerances. So a soy formula is going to be soy-based, and it is lactose-free. It's 20 calories per ounce, um, and it is just that standard mixture as well. We use this for lactase deficiency, galactosemia, and then just really and truly for personal preference. So if we have a family who is perhaps vegetarian, um, sometimes this is a formula they may want to choose, or some families just want to have a soy formula for their own reasons, and that's perfectly fine because they are nutritionally complete as well. Um, formulas that are available for soy formulas are going to be made by Infamil and Semilac as well. Um, Gerber Good Start also makes a soy formula, and so those are all out on the market and readily available for parents. Reduced lactose, um, notice I didn't put lactose free up here because they're not 100% lactose free. They are decreased lactose content. Um, they as well are 20 calories per ounce for their standard mixture. And we use these for infants thought to be sensitive to lactose or who have a slight intolerance to a milk protein based formula. And what I mean by that is perhaps you have a baby that might be a little bit fussy or maybe you have a baby that the parent says, you know, they just are really gassy, or I just feel like they are uncomfortable when they eat. Sometimes you can't explain it, but if there are some questionable tolerance issues with formulas, the reduced lactose formulas are available um, as well. Some of those out on the market are going to be semilac sensitive. That particular formula is 98% less lactose than a standard milk-based formula, so it is significantly reduced. Infamil Gentle Ease um, is a formula that has about 20% of the lactose that comes as a source of carbohydrates. So those are some that we can look at, but again, they are decreased lactose. They're not 100% lactose-free. Now the next one is going to be formulas specifically for spit-up. Um, we do have a lot of babies that um, will spit up, Spit up is normal. Um, that's one thing that we always teach new moms to is if they're not used to having a baby and they're a first time mom, sometimes they need to be sort of taught what is a normal volume of spit up. So 
as healthcare professionals, if we can look at the amount of spit up, we can also gauge if it's normal or excessive. Um, it is a milk-based formula that has added rice starch, which can help reduce the frequency or volume of the spit up, which can be very helpful. These formulas are, again, 20 calories per ounce for standard mixture. And we use these for excess spitting up and for babies with reflux. Infamil AR and Similac for spit up are two of the common examples that are out on the market. Now, I will tell you, uh, these formulas, while we talk about concentrating feeds and making them have more calories in them to help babies that struggle to grow, grow, these formulas, I should have put it up here, but I didn't, but these formulas can only be concentrated to 24 calories per ounce. So that is something we have to recognize, too, is that if babies require higher concentration levels for improved growth, we can't concentrate these beyond 24 calories per ounce. The next level is going to be a partially hydrolyzed formula. This is a hypoallergenic protein source, and it is lactose-free as well. It is 20 calories for the standard mixture. Um, and this we use for milk protein allergies. So we do have a fair number of children that do have milk protein allergies, and this would be the formula we would put them on. So a lot of kids that have milk protein allergies may be on a standard milk-based formula. They may have tried a soy. They may have tried some reduced lactose formulas. They may have tried a bunch of different formulas, or they may not have. But when they are diagnosed with a milk protein allergy, they are immediately put on a partially hydrolyzed formula. Those are going to be, examples of those will be Enfamil Nutriamogen, also Similac Alimentum, and Enfamil Progestamil. Those formulas are all um, appropriate for a milk protein allergy. Um, and for fat malabsorption as well, some babies who um, don't tolerate a standard formula or perhaps are having a lot of loose stooling, a lot of diarrhea, uh, we may need to put them on a formula that's already partially hydrolyzed so that they can better tolerate it. I included the premature discharge formula. This is a formula that um, is seen quite a bit. Um, I wish I had some statistics on the numbers of premature infants out there, but they have increased nutrient needs because they were born premature. And so it's very important if a baby was born premature that we keep them on that preemie discharge formula up to a corrected age of nine months if possible. There are instances where we don't, but if possible. Um, they are, this particular formula is nutrient enriched. It's a milk-based formula, and it is specific for those premature babies. If you'll notice, it does have more calories as the standard mixture because they need those calories to grow. That's very important for them to have what a lot of us call catch-up growth. It's very important to have that 22 calorie per ounce mixture or higher. Many premature babies are on higher concentrations of formula. We use these when they're discharged from the neonatal ICU. Um, the formula supports catch-up growth, as we said, and it provides the needed calcium and phosphorus for their bone health. Premature babies need added calcium and phosphorus for their bones, and this particular formula, um, being a premature discharge formula, provides that. Examples of those formulas are going to be Similac Neosure and Enfamil Infacare. I'm giving you guys throughout um, this information, Similac and Enfamil options, because I know many places have certain ones they use in their facility. So this gives you options depending on what your facility does. And then amino acid-based formulas. So this is also a hypoallergenic formula, but this is hypo hypoallergenic uh, for infants with multiple food allergies or who are just in need of this 100% free amino acid. It is a 20 calorie standard mixture. We use this formula often for babies who do have milk protein allergies that have failed with use of the partially hydrolyzed formula. We use this with short bowel syndrome, eosinophilic GI disorders, malabsorption, severe food allergies, and in general, infants who have 
significant intolerance to formulas. If we have babies that are um, on different types of formulas and we have intolerances or we're having significant reflux, we're having diarrhea, we're just having a lot of GI issues, many times a free amino acid formula is what a baby needs to go on. And then we would sort of try to look and see um, if tolerance is better and it should improve. And when those formulas are available, the Elicare infant and Neocate infant are formulas that are available. They may be slightly harder to find uh, depending on where you live and what um, grocery stores or other stores are available. Um, most states also carry this through their WIC program as well. It is a very expensive formula, so we always think about that when any baby is put on it. You want to make sure that do they really need this formula because it is definitely more expensive if a family is going to have to pay for it out of pocket. But if it is medically indicated, many times it helps with that list of problems. So what we've talked about thus far is sort of those standard everyday formulas. Those are going to be the formulas that day in and day out you're going to use, I'm going to use, that we're going to recommend to our patients. But recognizing as well there's a lot of other medical issues out there and there's a lot of other specialty formulas that we may need to use. Some of those are going to be metabolic disorders. The metabolic disorders will have specialized formulas. Um, neonatal units, for a patient who's actively in a neonatal unit, they're going to be on some other specialized formulas. We may have some different formulas available on the market that we haven't talked about. Some of those, again, are for specific needs, but what we've talked about today are those day in and day out formulas that you're going to recommend, that I'm going to recommend for our patients. So I also want to just go over some of the availability of infant formula. It generally comes in three types. Ready to feed formula, depending on what families want to do, whether they want to mix or not want to mix. The ready to use formula is pour it in a bottle, put the nipple on, and the baby can feed it. Um, there is no mixing needed, but it is the most expensive, and that sort of is the toughest part, is it is more expensive. Uh, powdered formula is the most common formula used, but it is mixed with a specified amount of water and it is the least expensive. And liquid concentrate, if you've seen the liquid concentrate, um, that is a liquid and it's concentrated and all you do is add water to it as directed on the can. So lots of options available for parents, it just depends on their preference. Now, formula mixing, um, this is something that I find to be very important when we're talking about a new parent, or it may be that this is, formula mixing is new to this parent. Maybe they breastfeed a, a previous child, but with this particular infant, there are some medical issues and we're having to use a specialty formula, um, and we need to make sure that all parents feel comfortable with how to mix a formula. If formulas are not mixed correctly, it can affect a lot of things. Most importantly, it can affect growth and development. Um, adequate nutrition is important to make sure that they developmentally stay on track, that their brain is developing as it should. And then also, if we think about mixing formula, if we are mixing it incorrectly, that can affect electrolytes. If we give babies extra water, um, sometimes parents will give babies water because they think they need the extra hydration. Extra water over time can affect a sodium level, and when a sodium level goes too low, it can cause seizures. So we do want to make sure we're mixing correctly, that parents know no additional water for babies unless they um, have been told by their pediatrician have any specialized needs, but generally no extra water. So what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to actually show you guys proper mixing um, for just standard 20 calorie per ounce infant formula. Now if you'll notice I have some other numbers up here. We can do things like 22 calories per ounce. We can do 24 calories. We can even do 26, 27, 28, 30. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that we can mix infant formula based specifically on what the patient needs are. 
Um, recipes for concentrating the formulas can be found in the product guides, which I brought to show you guys. Um, I love my product guides because they have mixing instructions in them. So if you don't have these, these are great. Just keep them in your desk drawer, keep them at your nurse's station, wherever it is that um, you feel like you would want to have it. It also gives in here information on the products themselves. And then the other thing that I recommend is having, we call it our formula mixing book. Some people call it a recipe book. But it is a book that we keep at all of our nurses' stations. And this actually gives you information on how to mix to the different calorie levels based on the specific formula that you're using. Um, and it really just needs to be for all of us standard across the board. So you pull your recipes from your product guides, give those to your, to your families if you want to make up handouts for them. That's also very helpful so that they know how much water and how much powder, or if they're doing the liquid concentrate, how much liquid concentrate and how much water for that proper mixing. So we're gonna, gonna clear a little space here and we're gonna mix. Now normally, um, when mixing formula, we're gonna wash our hands first. Um, and then after that, put on some gloves. If you're preparing it for, um, for your patient. And I always encourage everyone to make sure that, um, that your family is very engaged with what you're doing. Um, formula mixing seems like something that's so simple, but it actually can contribute to things that if patients are not being fed the right concentration, it's being mixed wrong, failure to thrive, just poor weight gain in general. Um, and we want to make sure that we give every infant the opportunity to have adequate nutrition to maximize all of their growth potential. So I'm just going to cut this. And I just washed my hands, right? My hands are clean. Okay. So what I'm actually going to do is, on the back of the can, any can is going to have mixing instructions on it. The typical way to mix a standard formula is going to be two ounces of water and one scoop of powder. So what we're going to do is we're going to mix that out. And I am going to double check myself. The other thing to recognize, too, is whether a parent is making this for home or they're making it while they're in the hospital or wherever that may be, um, we do want to make sure that once it is mixed up, if a baby consumes off of the bottle, within an hour it has to be utilized or thrown away. Um, we don't want to leave bottles sitting out and uh, a baby accidentally get a bottle that's been sitting. So fresh bottle with every mixture. And the other thing is many times if you want to recommend to parents that they make a larger bottle than what they need, it's perfectly fine to do that. They would just mix up. If they want to do a full bottle, they can. Um, and then pour off into a separate bottle what they're going to actually use for that feeding and take the unused bottle, make sure that they label, date it, put it in the refrigerator, and use it within 24 hours. So it's certainly acceptable to make formula in advance. It just has to be refrigerated. So what I'm going to do for this particular one is I'm going to mix four ounces of water and two scoops of powder. So I'm going to actually bend down so that I can get good an eye level with it. And that's the important thing, too, is to make sure that when you put your water in your bottle that you do get eye level. Because if you're looking up or you're too low or you have it and you're holding it, you're not going to have it flat. So it needs to be on a flat surface and you want to get eye level with it. So I do have the four ounces in here. My powder is a little messy here, so we might see a little spill out, but that's all right. So we want to make sure that our powdered formula is full. We don't want it to be heaping. And many times on the infant formula containers, they will tell you whether it should be an unpacked or a packed level scoop. But it should always be level. 
So we have four ounces of water and we're going to put in two scoops. One little tip I have is so many times I see people who struggle to get the powder in the, the bottle because the bottle opening is not very large. So if you just angle both a little bit and you flip, it goes in a lot easier. Let's close that up. You also want to label and date your opened container of formula as well um, so that you make sure as well that you don't have old formula that you're using. Always check the date on your can too. Um, whether you're using ready to feed powder or liquid concentrate, they all have an expiration date on it. So you always want to check on that as well. Make sure that everything's in date. And then once we put the top on, make sure it's on where we're good. We're just going to mix. So if I had a baby that I was getting ready to feed, and this infant only needed two ounces. I just made up four ounces, so I would grab a separate bottle, put my two ounces in for feeding, and then I'm going to take this one I just mixed in, and I'm going to put it over in the refrigerator and save it for the next feeding. All right, so I'm going to leave that there. And then um, let's go back to our slides. So making a recipe book for whether you're working at a doctor's office, whether you're at a hospital, anything is going to be beneficial so that if you need to use concentrated formulas, um, you have that available. The 20 calorie or the 22 calorie if you're using a free me discharge formula is always going to be on the can. But anything beyond that, you may want to have quick access to. Um, we always put water in the bottle first. So make sure that you're not putting the powder first. We always put water in the bottle first followed by the powder. So when would you need to concentrate an infant formula? Um, a lot of different reasons. I certainly did not put all of them up here, but some examples are going to be heart condition, cancer, poor growth, those failure to thrive babies that come in, um, reflux. Sometimes we have babies that need those calories to grow, but when they hit a certain volume, they start spitting more of it up. So we may have to concentrate the feeds to get the calories in to decrease that volume. Restricted feeding volumes for other reasons, whether it be just lung reasons, respiratory, if they have poor oral skills, um, sometimes we have to concentrate those feedings. They may be able to eat, but if you needed them to, say, take in 60 mLs, but they consistently could only take in 45, then many times we need to crunch numbers and see, hey, can we get it in 45 since they can do that amount? Um, so those are just kind of some of the, a few of the reasons we might concentrate feeds. Well, there are plenty others out there. So for normal growth for infants, um, they do grow very quickly. That's why nutrition is so important for their development, um, both physically, but also too for their brain. Uh, they should double their birth weight by six months of age, and then they should triple it by one year. So those are some kind of fun numbers to make parents aware of so that they can be on the lookout for that with some of their checkups or just if they're in the hospital. Um, the growth curve, that's very, very important. We should be evaluating that with every admission or every doctor's visit. Anytime they get a weight and it goes into an electronic medical record, we should be looking at that. Um, if you don't have electronic medical records, you can always do it on the old-fashioned paper. You can go into PD tools. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can evaluate to see where their growth curve has been and where it's going. Uh, that tells us so much. We want to look at those previous weights if they're available and we want to compare to where we are now. That tells us if they're um, adequately nourished and if not, maybe we need to tease out if there is something else going on. Um, and malnutrition can be classified using z-scores from the growth chart. So the growth chart is really important because if we do have a significantly underweight baby or even slightly underweight, um, that may be good information for us to have to classify if they are or are not malnourished. So these are some other little just kind of tips that I threw in. Um, we said earlier that if formula is not consumed within one hour, and let me also just kind of stop and say a baby shouldn't take an hour to feed. If they're taking an hour to feed, that's entirely too long. Usually around 20 minutes, give or take a little bit. Um, 
but within an hour, and in many times, babies with reflux, we may stop and do a lot of burping, and so it may take some time, but um, usually within one hour, we want to be done and throw that away. Um, do not keep it or put it back in the refrigerator. Sometimes that's a really difficult one to have this bottle full of formula that maybe a baby is sick and not feeling well, and it's really hard to throw that away, but we have to. Um, we never want to cut the nipple or try to make the hole bigger in the bottle. Um, if the infant is having trouble feeding, then we may need to try a different stage nipple. It may be that they need to see feeding team, feeding therapy, depending on what your facility calls it. There are a lot of therapy, speech therapy and occupational therapy that can help with some of those feeding skills and can assess if we need a different nipple. Um, baby foods and infant cereals in general should not be put in a bottle, they should be consumed from a spoon. So um, we do want to make sure that we're encouraging that because that does help with development. Those are feeding skills that all babies need to learn is eating off of a spoon and getting some of the texture that they're going to get from the infant cereals and the baby foods. The only time I tell any parent to put a, any kind of like um, cereal in a bottle is if their physician has recommended it. Um, so as a general rule, off of a spoon only. I wanted to throw a couple other little tips in here for tube feedings. Um, first and foremost, just kind of know your access. Is it going to be an NG? Is it going to be an OG, an NJ, a G tube, a GJ tube, a J tube? Um, so many different ways that we can feed babies out there, which is great um, if they can't eat by mouth. But do recognize if there is an NJ or a J-tube that we only can do continuous feeds. That is not um, a way to bolus. We cannot bolus through an NJ or a J-tube. Um, open systems, for those of you using any kind of open systems, hang time is usually four hours or less. So whatever you're pouring into your bag when you're preparing that tube feeding, Definitely make sure that if you know your rate's running at 20 an hour and you have a four hour hang time, you put no more than 80 in your bag. You can know that your tubing probably has maybe 10 mLs or something like that in it. So maybe you put a total of 90 in for that 20 mL an hour feed. Um, but we do have to every four hours make sure that um, we're only putting that amount in. Um, intolerances to feeds can be different for different reasons. We do want to look at our delivery volume, our formula, illness. Um, many times we'll have babies that were previously tolerating feeds at home, but then when they're in the hospital, they aren't tolerating it, and you sometimes have to tease out why that is. And it may be something as simple as just their respiratory status, and they were doing bolus feeds at home but maybe need to be on continuous now. Um, and then we can get back to where they were when they're feeling better, but sometimes we have to alter how we feed in the short term to get to that ultimate goal of getting discharged, getting home, and getting back on that home regimen. A few references, and that's all I have for you guys, but I would love to hear from you. I would love to know if you have any other topics that you want to hear about. Um, I love nutrition. I love everything about it. I love babies, I love the big kids, so please tell me anything you want to hear about and we can have conversations about that and I would love to hear from you guys. So thanks for your time.